J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program, coming to you from Matherfield, California, presented by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Army Air Corps. Friends, have you noticed how much better, how much richer tasting Jell-O is today? Well, that's because Jell-O's grand flavor is now locked in, protected for your pleasure by Jell-O's new and exclusive process. This marvelous process locks the flavor right into the tiny Jell-O particles, gives you extra goodness, brings you a new high in dessert enjoyment. Yes, Jell-O is the perfect dessert, a dessert that fairly coaxes you to enjoy it. Its color and beauty make Jell-O so enticing. And its rich tang and flavor just can't be beat. Jell-O offers you flavor as refreshing as the juicy ripe fruit itself. Swell, tempting flavor that's extra delightful because it's locked in. Prove to yourself how much better Jell-O's locked in flavor really is. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no telltale aroma, no sign of escaping fragrance and flavor. Then dissolve the Jell-O. And notice how Jell-O's captive goodness comes pouring out in a rush of richness. Get Jell-O tomorrow, friends. There's a real thrill waiting for you when you try Jell-O's new locked-in flavor. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our broadcast today originates from Mather Field near Sacramento, Mather Field, where Uncle Sam's Eagles of the Sky are trained. Yes, sir. Those young men whose flying ability and courage make them unquestioned monarchs as they soar through the clouds. Whee! <laughs> you said it. So, without further ado, we bring you a man who gets dizzy when he looks over the edge of a teacup, <laughs> Jack Benny! <laughs> Thank you, fellas, thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that was a fine build-up. Imagine saying I get dizzy when I look over the edge of a teacup. <laughs> Why well, read fortunes in a gypsy tea room for five months without taking one spill? <laughs> Believe me, I'm, I'm no softy. Well, Jack, all I meant was... I don't care what you meant. And for your information, Don, when I was a youngster in Waukee, in Illinois, I was the first person there to fly. To fly? Why, well, I never knew that. Well, it's a fact. When I was about seven years old, my father gave me a great big kite. I tied the string around my waist like a darn fool. A tornado came along, and I landed in St. Joe, Missouri. St. <laughs> Joe. They love you there. <laughs> now, cut out that ad living. <laughs> you orchestra boys are here just to blow your brains out. And about one more toot should do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the truth, Don I was on the end of that kite and I lit in good old St. Joe But Jack, weren't you hurt when he came down? Uh, no, Don, you see, my ears stuck out in those days And I glided right into a three-point landing <laughs> Two elbows and my cigar <laughs> Oh, really, I, uh, I wasn't hurt at all A cigar? My goodness, Jack. Did you smoke a cigar when you were seven years old? I had it in my mouth, Don, but I didn't light it until I was 21. <laughs> I had terrific willpower. Well, if it isn't our own little bundle for broadcasting. Hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, you fellas. Contact. <laughs> hey, you did all right. Well, Mary, um, how do you like it at Matherfield? Oh, swell. But you know, Jack, all the boys here are so bashful. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, they, uh, they are a rather quiet group of fellas, you know. And they're so shy and reserved. That's right, that's right. All they think about is aviation. Yeah, now let's start over and quit kidding. <laughs> Uh, 
Now you're talking. Say, Mary, I noticed you're wearing a pair of wings on your lapel. Where'd you get them? Oh, the cutest aviator gave them to me. <laughs> what a doll. Gave them to you? Mary, these boys aren't supposed to give away their wings. Well, he didn't give them to me exactly. When he backed away, they stuck to my coat. <laughs> Oh, 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 I see. You, you kissed him. And you, uh, you just met the fella? Well, he reminded me that it was Mother's Day, so what could I do? <laughs> well, that was sweet of you, Mary. So you gave him a nice, motherly kiss. Uh-huh. Good. Well, at least it started out that way. <laughs> Mary, why is it that every time we play a camp, you have to always... Hey, Mr. Benny... Speaking of Mother's Day, you know oh. I... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. <laughs> well. Hey, Mr. Benny, speaking of Mother's Day, you uh, know... Take, uh, take a bow, kid. I took it already. <laughs> oh. Hey, Mr. Benny, speaking of Mother's Day... How, um... How... <laughs> How... Uh, how did you, uh, how'd you come up here, Dennis? I, I didn't see you on the train. Don't you remember? You put me in a crate in the baggage car. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's right. You promised to bring me water once in a while, but you didn't. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, kid. It, uh, it slipped my mind. The baggage man reached in for my autograph and I bit him. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's my fault for putting Rover on the box, you know. <laughs> I should have known better. Say, Mr. Benny, speaking of Mother's Day, you know what I sent my mother? No, what'd you send her, Dennis? A picture of me at the age of 45. <laughs> what? I drew some bags under my eyes. <laughs> oh, well, it was nice that you sent her something. Mary, I hope uh, you didn't forget Mother's Day. I should say not. I sent Mama two beautiful canaries. Two canaries? Yeah, one whistles deep in the heart of Texas and the other one claps its wings. <laughs> well, I'm sure the old girl get a kick out of that, you know. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, fellas. Make the old man with the gray hair jealous. Ah, what a reception. They love you here, Phil, do they? <laughs> You're telling me. Say, Jackson, ain't this a coincidence? Here it is, Mother's Day, and we're at Mother Field. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Mather Field. And although I pronounced it wrong last week. I mean, and speaking of, uh, Mother's Day... <laughs> Speaking of Mother's Day, Phil, uh, did you remember your mother? Yeah, she's a little white-haired lady, about five foot two. I don't mean that. <laughs> I don't mean that at all. I mean, uh, what did you send her? Oh, oh, well, I'll tell you, Jackson. I cut off one of my curls, put it in a small box, and mailed it to her. Cut off one of your curls? Well, that's the corniest thing I ever heard of. I'd like to see you do it. I can do it, don't worry Well, personally, Phil, I think that sending your mother a lock of your hair was a very sentimental gesture I bet she got a big kick out of it Well, I don't know I got a wire from her this morning that said Receive fried noodles, where's the chopped suey? <laughs> well, I'll be doggone At least you meant well Hey, Dennis Yes, please? Uh, Dennis, I, uh I think it's about time for your song, so go ahead and entertain the boys. Okay. I'm so sick of dog biscuits, I could scream. <laughs> Forget about that crate. Now go ahead with your song. <laughs> Johnny Doughboy found a rose in Ireland. The fairest flower that e'er and never grew. Oh, the blarney in her talk took him back to all New York, where his mother spoke the sweetest blarney too. Johnny Dobb. 
boy found a rose in Ireland And she stole his heart with smiling eyes of blue He said, darling, tis my duty To make an American beauty Of a sweet Irish rose like you Girls are girls in Londonderry In Kilkenny, Cork or Kerry From the Shannon to Duncanon They're all sweet as can be But there's one who'll soon be knowing That my heart is overflowing Tis an Irish girl I love And she's just Oh, I found a rose in Ireland And she stole his heart with smiling eyes of blue He said, darling, tis my duty To make an American beauty Of a sweet Irish rose Johnny Doughboy sung by Dennis Day, and Dennis, that was swell. Thanks. And I'd like to dedicate that number to all the navigators, pilots, and enlisted men here at Mesa Field. Well, that's very nice. And now, folks... What's a navigator, Mr. Benny? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll explain it to you later, kid. Tell him now. I'd like to get the leakage. <laughs> okay. Well... The, uh, the navigator, fellas, is one of the key members of the air crew. I mean, he's the man who must plan the entire mission on what is known as a Mercator chart. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Just oh, for me. Well, let me explain it this way. When the plane takes off, the pilot proceeds to an initial point, and the navigator instructs him what compass course to fly from this point. The navigator must next determine the ground speed, and in order to do this, he solves what is known as a triangle. You know what a triangle is, don't you? Sure, a man, a woman, and a guy under a sofa. <laughs> Phil, it's not your kind of a triangle. <laughs> it's a wind triangle. Anyway, it is uh, frequently necessary to check accuracy by making celestial observations. To make these observations, the navigator uses an instrument known as a sextant. Ooh, what he said. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, pay attention. <laughs> Thus, <laughs> no use, I'll have to talk to that kid. <laughs> Thus, by noting his compass and using the sextant, the navigator can determine his precise position. Now, are there any questions? Yeah, how can you use such big words without your teeth flying out? <laughs> I've got a bridge like the Golden Gate and keep still. <laughs> and now, folks, as I was about to announce... Mary Livingston will read one of her famous poems. Now, wait a minute, Mary. I don't care if you did write a poem. You're not going to read it tonight. You let me read my poem or I'll tell all these fellows that when you were in the Navy... Never mind. You went up to the crow's nest looking for eggs. <laughs> Well, I was hungry. <laughs> All right, Mary, what's the, uh, what's the title of your poem? Uh, she was only a pilot sweetheart, but she sure had a lot of control. <laughs> good, good, good. Proceed. <clears throat> <clears throat> Here we are at Mather Field, near the town of Sacramento, in the good old USA, where FDR is presidento. <laughs> well, we know where we are, anyway. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, get to going. 
I met a boy here yesterday and got acquainted right away. You always do. He was so handsome and so cute in his new zoot suit with a parachute. <laughs> hmm. Some description. Uh, say, Jack. What? Did Longfellow work with a stooge? No. Then keep still. <laughs> Oh, pardon me. Uh, go ahead. He showed me his plane with motors twin and said to me, let's go for a spin. But we'd had no introduction, so I stayed right there for ground instruction. Good. How many more verses, Mary? Uh, one more, and it's all about bombardiers. Okay. I'd like to be a bombardier and drop a bomb on Hitler's ear. Well. And when he turned to see what got him, I'd drop another on his... Very good. <laughs> Well, Mary, you did a fine job there. Now, Phil, I think the only thing that could follow Mary's poem would be a good hot band number, so go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Yes? Mr. Benny, I'm from Postal Telegraph. Would you like to buy a war savings bond and send it to Fred Allen? Well, I'd like to buy a bond, but why should I send it to Allen? The shock, the shock would, would kill, kill him. him. I know. <laughs> you got an idea there. Come on out in the hall, bud. I'll write you a check. Play, Phil. give you anything but love, baby, from that new colored caravan in New York. And uh, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Say, Phil, uh, come here a minute. I've got some very important news for you. What is it? Uh, you too, Dennis. Now pay attention. Okay, hold my yo-yo. <laughs> Put that down. Now, uh, fellas, now listen carefully. Incidentally, Mary and Don already know about this. But it so happens, fellas, that the end of this season will be our last year with Jell-O. What? You mean we're going to get fired? I knew it couldn't last. We've been getting away with murder. <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's what happened. Our sponsor, Mr. Mortimer, got in town from New York last Wednesday, called me up and said he wanted to see me about a very important matter. Were you worried, Mr. Benny? About losing my job? Of course not. Ha <laughs> ha, not much you weren't worried. Well, I wasn't. Then why were you in Rochester rehearsing Uncle Tom's Cabin all week? <laughs> That's only for the summer. Mervyn's going to direct it. Now, uh, you're... We're going to play up and down the coast. Can I be a bloodhound, Mr. Benny? <laughs> yes, Dennis, I'll just take the crate off of you. <laughs> anyway, fellas, the sponsor called up, so I made a date to see him that afternoon. Mary, Don, and I got in the Maxwell, and Rochester drove us over to Mr. Mortimer's office on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> Rochester. Rochester, will you please watch what you're doing? What's the matter, boss? Take it easy. We're not supposed to drive over 40 miles an hour anymore. Anymore? <laughs> 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 
Yes. This car couldn't hit 40 if it was dropped off the Empire State Building loaded with monkeys. Now, wait a minute. The speedometer says 62. That's nothing. It says 50 when we're out of gas. <laughs> what? Well, I'll kick it back to 15 if it'll make you feel better. Just take it easy. You know, I'm... I've... I've got a lot on my mind today. Oh, calm down, Jack. Just because our sponsor's in town and wants to see you doesn't mean you're going to get fired. Oh, yeah? Why, certainly, Jack. Mr. Mortimer probably just wants to speak to you. Yes, and I know what he'll say. Goodbye, Benny. Hello, Skelton. <laughs> we're, we're dead ducks, I tell you. Rochester, there'll be a rehearsal tonight. <laughs> now, remember... You're going to be Topsy. Why can't I be Uncle Tom? My Topsy is Turvy. There's no time for recasting. I tell you, if we don't... Rochester, watch what you're doing. You went right through a red light. Boss, if you want the wheel, here it is. Stick that back on there. I'm... I'm nervous enough. Imagine, Mary, I've been with Jell-O eight years, and Mr. Mortimer wants to cast me aside like an old shoe. Old shoe is right. Look at that pair you've got on. Never mind. And sewing those patches on your coat. Who do you think you're fooling? Listen, Mary, a little sympathy won't hurt. <laughs> you had to get all dressed up. Where do you think you're going to, a wedding? Don, tear your collar a little, will you? <laughs> right, right there on the side. Now, Jack, you're just imagining things. I'm sure you're not going to get fired. After all, you're a great comedian. I stink, and you know it. <laughs> the heck with that soft stuff. I'm serious, Jack. You're very important. Jell-O needs you. I'd feel a lot better if I was sliced bananas. <laughs> oh, well. I wouldn't mind if I'd have saved my money. I'd only put something aside for a rainy day. Well, don't worry, Jack. I can always go back to the May Company. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I filled out your application this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I... I don't know what's going to happen. I'd never leave you, boss. I'd work for you for nothing. That's mighty sweet of you, Rochester. I'm working for next to nothing now. <laughs> All right, just be thankful that you've got a job, which is probably more than I have. Well, say, Jack, that's the building across the street, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Now, Mary, when we get in Mr. Mortimer's office, I wish you'd let me do the talking. You just sit in the corner and wipe your eyes once in a while, you know. I'll give you the cue. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Mr. Mortimer is expecting you. Yay! <laughs> I mean, good morning, Miss Stewart. Don, you wait out here for us. Come on, let's go in, Mary. Good luck, Jack. Thanks. Well, hello, Jack. Mary, glad to see you. Hello, Mr. Mortimer. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Mortimer. <laughs> Excuse me, I caught a cold. <laughs> Down here in my chest. Just... Just killing me. Oh, that's too bad. Now, Jack, here's what I wanted to see you about. You don't... You don't have to beat around the bush, Mr. Mortimer. I'm not a child. I can take it, you know. Now, Jack... But you can't do this to me, Morse Mortimer. Uh, Mr. Mortimer. <laughs> I've... I've given the best years of my life to this program, and you're... You're not going to shoo me aside like an old throw. It's, it's, it's not fair. But, Jack, I can't understand what you're so upset about. I've got good news for you. Well, still, it's halfway out the window now. <laughs> Just getting a little breath of air, that's all. What's, uh, what's the good news, Mr. Mortimer? Here's the situation, Jack. You've been with Jell-O for eight years, and naturally, we're very pleased with what you've done. Uh-huh. So, next season, General Foods wants you to broadcast for another one of our products. You mean... I'm not leaving your company? You, you mean we're going to be together 
next year? You mean he sewed that patch on his sleeve for nothing? <laughs> Mary. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Mortimer, that, that is good news. Eh, Mary? Shall I cry now? It's not necessary. Your cold is gone, too. <laughs> Mary, please. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. Mortimer. To tell the truth, I, I kind of expected this. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, Mr. Mortimer, I'll work just as hard as ever. We know that, Jack. Now, please give me that revolver. You won't need it. <laughs> Here you are. Gee, I, I can't wait till I tell Don Wilson. Well, goodbye, Mr. Mortimer. Come on, Mary. Oh, Don! Don, I've got good news for you. Good news? Well, what is it, Jack? We're leaving Jell-O, Don. Next year, we're going to broadcast for another product. What? We're leaving Jell-O? That's right, Don. But they're going to keep selling it, you know. Don't worry, they're... But, Jack, do you mean to tell me that next season I can't talk about tempting and delicious Jell-O? America's favorite gelatin dessert? <laughs> well, I'm, uh... I'm afraid not, Don. You mean I, I won't be able to tell people to get out of their neighborhood grocer and get jello with a new locked in flavor? No, Don. No, I won't do it. I can't. I won't. I won't do it. But, Don, don't cry. Look, you can still tell people to, do, to go down to their neighborhood grocer and buy this new product. Well,. As long as they're at their, they're at their grocers, can't they buy a little package of Jell-O, too? <laughs> well, of course! Of course! Of course, they'll, they'll always be able to get Jell-O. And here's something else, Don. Listen to this. Our new product will be economical, too, and who knows? It may even be delicious with sliced bananas. Why, it'll be wonderful, Don. Wait till we get rolling. You'll love it. Now, come on, kids. Let's go. Here's a good idea, friends, for your next Jell-O dessert. It's peach and raspberry pie made with delicious raspberry Jell-O. Say, it's one of the most enticing treats you ever tasted. And nothing could be easier to make. Simply dissolve one package of Jell-O imitation raspberry flavor in one and a half cups of hot water. Chill until slightly thickened, then fold in one cup of heavy whipped cream and two cups of canned sliced peaches drained. Or if you wish, Use one box of quick frozen sliced peaches, freshly thawed. Turn into a baked pie shell and chill until firm. The result will be one of the best desserts that ever graced a table. A wonderful combination of juicy sliced peaches and bright red raspberry jello. Get several packages of raspberry jello tomorrow. And when you do, be sure to ask for genuine jello because jello's locked in flavor is extra rich. This is the last number of the 30-second program in the current Jell-O series. And next Sunday, we will broadcast from the Army Air Force Replacement Center near Santa Ana, California. And folks, it sure was great being here today at Mather Field. And I'd like to thank uh, Colonel Leland R. Hewitt and his staff for all their courtesies. And incidentally, I wish all of the young men listening in could see this marvelous Air Navigation Training Center. Believe me, boys, a navigator ain't no small potato. Good luck, fellas, and good night, folks. The Jell-O program is written by Bill Maher and Ed Beloyne and is broadcast each week by short wave to our armed forces throughout the world. The presentation of this program from Mesa Field has been for the entertainment of the personnel station here and does not necessarily constitute an endorsement of our product by the Army or its personnel. For a swell treat, there's nothing better than Jell-O puddings, those rich, creamy puddings that are made by the makers of Jell-O. Try Jell-O chocolate pudding. It's smooth, mellow, gloriously good with a wonderful, rich chocolate flavor developed especially for Jell-O puddings by the famous Walter Baker chocolate people. Tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O puddings in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Mather Field. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles.